Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you who've joined our CDDF webinar on diversity in clinical trials. Um, let me first explain to you what the CDDF is for those who join us for the first time. We are a nonprofit organization in Belgium, and we provide a neutral platform to stimulate interactions between stakeholders involved in cancer drug development. Our objective is to bring people together to discuss the relevant topics like the one today to improve cancer treatment. Next, please. The technical aspects for today, it's important that we all see this as an interactive exercise. If you have any technical problems, report them to us by using the chat function. If you ask questions, you can do so at any time during the presentation. You don't have to wait until the end. Please use the Q&A function for that. It's good to keep these two separate, although we monitor, of course, both. We, the monitors, my colleague uh, and co-moderator Shushmita Zen, and I, uh, Axel Glasmacher, will present the questions to our two speakers during the discussion, and you can obviously switch between uh, different Zoom screens. Next slide, please. We apply the Chatham House rule. That means you are free to use the information, especially that is revealed during the discussion, but not to um, uh, apply it to the identity or affiliation of the speaker. This also includes social media. So the Chatham House rule has allowed open and free discussions in, within the CDDF, and we think it's a successful way of managing um, this. Next slide, please. This is today's program. My name, as I said, is Axel Glasmacher. We will hear two presentations from Marie van lilienfeld Toel whom I will introduce in a minute, and from Lola fashoyin Ije, um, who will speak as a second speaker. Uh, my co-moderator, Dr. Shushmita Zen is here, and she and I will together present the questions and ask some questions ourselves, I suppose. Next slide, please. Marie van lienfeld is a professor of medicine at the University Clinic of Jena in Germany. She has a clinical and scientific focus on hematological malignancies and infectious diseases in immunocompromised patients with a focus on virology. She is the author of the COVID-19 guidelines of the German Austrian Swiss Societies of Hemato-Oncology and the EHA Scientific Working Group Infections in Hematology recommendations. And those of you who are more frequently in our webinars will have heard her, her speak about that. But also she is the founder and chairperson of the working group Diversity and Individual Medicine of the German Society of Hematology Oncology. And this will be the topic of her um, presentation today. So please, Marie, um, let's roll your presentation. Dear Axel, dear Sushmita, thanks for the kind introduction and thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about the concept of intersectionality as it may apply in oncology. I will begin with a case, a clinical case, and I myself work in the myeloma clinic, so it is focused on multiple myeloma. And I would like to present to you a 69-year-old female professor for social sciences of African-American descent, She's an active grandmother with two little grandchildren and is now presenting with a newly diagnosed symptomatic multiple myeloma, which by definition means she needs treatment. She does not have any relevant comorbidities and she presents in general good health. Now, what kind of individual factors um, might we consider? What kind of disparities may we expect? Um, what is relevant? And um, this is the wheel of power or privilege as it is drawn by Sylvia Duckworth to represent the concept of intersectionality, individual factors which intersect um, to give disparity, for example. And the most famous ones are race, class, and gender, but there are others to consider as well. Now, in this situation, how about race? 
In black patients, we know that multiple myeloma is dramatically more frequent than it is in non-Hispanic white patients, as seen here from the SEER data um, rather recently. Also, black patients tend to present a median of four years earlier than non-Hispanic white um, patients, as you can see here, also from SEER data. However, black patients tend to not receive the treatment that is usually given to non-Hispanic whites, as you can see here, with a lower frequency of treatment with proteasome inhibitors, um, immunomodulatory drugs, or stem cell transplantation, as seen here. Now, this may be influenced by the socioeconomic status, but I've, after matching for that, um, it still remains the same picture that non-Hispanic Black patients actually receive um, the modern treatment regimens um, less frequently. This is unfortunate because, in fact, if we look at the outcome of treatment if, and if that is matched for treatment along with everything else, um, Black patients actually do better, and they have a better survival than um, non-Hispanic white patients um, in this example. Now, what actually is the standard treatment for this situation? And this is, for example, given by multiple guidelines, and this is, as an example, the eha ESMO guideline on multiple myeloma rather recently published again. So patients who are usually um, below the age of 70 and deemed eligible for high-dose therapy and autologous stem cell transplantation, um, they receive an induction therapy um, and after that high-dose uh, followed by high-dose therapy, followed by um, stem cell transplantation, followed by maintenance treatment. Now, um, these may not be completely familiar to people who do not work with multiple myeloma every day, but these are different induction therapy options which are licensed at the moment and available. And the first one is VRD, usually abbreviated, um, consisting of bortezomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone. And we just keep that quickly in mind because um, I would like to show you what we can usually expect from that kind of treatment approach from very recently published data um, by Paul Richardson. This was a large trial comprising more than 700 patients who receive um, the named regimen, uh, bortezomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone, and were randomized to, in the middle of the treatment, receive high-dose therapy with autologous stem cell transplantation or not, just carry on with the RVD. And um, it, it, very strikingly and confirming prior evidence, this um, treatment approach showed that the transplantation actually leads to a longer progression-free survival in that group. Not to an overall survival benefit, but still um, progression-free survival is deemed um, uh, a benefit in itself. So this was the um, primary endpoint in that study. But the study was also remarkable in that it actually um, recruited different um, patients and is probably the first myeloma study to recruit a significant amount of black patients as well, along uh, almost 20%. And here in the subgroup analysis, it turns out that in this subgroup, in fact, the autologous stem cell transplantation does not give a benefit with regard to progression-free survival. And this is probably due to the fact that the standard therapy without high-dose um, treatment does so remarkably well with the progression-free survival um, of not reached in the median. So that is regarding the individual factor race. How about another individual factor this patient actually um, brings, and that is being female. In the recent years, there have been some publications um, looking at sex disaggregated data and multiple myeloma. And this is a large analysis of uh, the myeloma cohorts from the, the United Kingdom. So more than 3,000 patients 
receiving treatment for newly diagnosed multiple myeloma and then looking at sex disaggregated data for men and women separately and numerically women tend to be older at presentation they present at a similar clinical stage but they may actually harbor high risk disease more frequently determined by cytogenetic abnormalities but you might expect um, a survival disadvantage in women that is not the case. So women have the same median survival as men do, despite the fact that they have a higher risk disease. In our monocentric cohort, um, we looked at men and women as well. So this is a cohort of um, more than 600 patients um, who were treated at our institution over the course of 15 years. And some findings are actually confirming. So we could also see um, a me higher median age at presentation in women, although this was, again, not statistically significant. We also saw that the patients, the women and the men actually present at a similar clinical stage. Um, in our hands, uh, similarly, the risk uh, was more or there was a tendency towards um, a higher risk disease in women, but that did not prove statistically significant. But what we did find is that women tended to have a higher rate um, of moderate or severe anemia, um, but a lower rate of relevant comorbidities. Now, again, we also saw no survival benefit or in, no survival difference in men and women. In our hands, um, almost 50% received an autologous stem cell transplantation. And in this cohort, you can see there's no survival difference at all. Um, in fact, there was little difference in this cohort between men and women with regard to the way they were treated, with regard to, to um, toxicities or response, with the exception of a very um, distinct difference in the frequency of mucositis. This is defined as mucositis requiring opioid therapy and parenteral nutrition, which is almost twice the rate in women compared to men. So um, women do have a higher rate of toxicity, remarkably so. And why may that be the case? Um, there are some considerations that this may actually be due to the way uh, melphalan is dosed, which is by body surface area. And um, that actually leads to a higher dose per kilogram body weight in women because it is, um, it's a matter of the, the height and women are usually smaller. So they have a lower body surface area and um, that leads to a higher dose in terms of the body weight. This may be one of the reasons why women have a higher rate of toxicity. Back to our case. In her case, and thinking about the um, treatment she would require, uh, we need to ask ourselves, where is the evidence for this particular patient comprising the individual factors she um, comes along with? Now, if we um, agree that there's not much evidence for that particular situation, what happens if we deduce recommendations from the cohorts we have evidence from? So um, the 20% cohort in um, the, of black patients in that myeloma trial or um, the, the um, information we have on European women with multiple myeloma. So if we deduce that, um, what could we tell the patient? And I think most importantly, um, we need to understand what her aim of the treatment actually is to then give her the best option she has. And um, not have any avoidable disparities which may actually be present. And this is the motto of the World Cancer Day of this year. So the, the motto is close the care gap. And um, they actually uh, um, 
actually focus on the topic of inequity and have a very nice summary of what they mean by inequity um, on their website. And really, basically, it boils down to the fact that one size does not fit all. And every challenge demands a different solution, as we've just seen in our case. And equity is about giving everyone what they need to bring them up to the same level. And that brings us back again to that wheel of power, which is the concept of intersectionality, because in fact, um, when we look at that wheel of power, it is the inner circle um, which is best represented in medical evidence. So these are the people um, we know most about, and these are also the people um, we the, the evidence based medicine actually suits best. Is that just um, a hypothesis or is that in fact actually true? It is in fact true and there's upcoming evidence more and more that um, marginalized groups, so those people who are sort of the outer circles are underrepresented in clinical trials. And here's just a very recent pop, um, publication looking at clinical trials and hematological malignancies. And in all malignancies, you can see that black patients are underrepresented females are underrepresented. And then when you look at different diseases, and for example, multiple myeloma, in particular, the underrepresentation of black patients is rather dramatic compared to um, the incidence in the seer population. And does it actually matter? Do we actually find differences when we do look at the outer circles? Well, there's evidence that we will find difference or confirm differences and that that actually may influence our practice. For example, regarding socioeconomic deprivation in Germany, there's data um, showing that men with prostate cancer have a 15% lower five-year overall survival if they live in a most deprived um, area. Regarding gender, there's um, accumulating evidence that the, the triple therapy we are used to for colorectal cancer may actually only be beneficial for men and not for women because they do not require two cytotoxic agents. Regarding skin color, I've just shown you some evidence um, on treatment outcome, but sometimes it's it's other aspects as well. For example, reference values, and um, there's also much evidence, and this is actually well known, that the lower limit of normal in neutrophil counts for people of African descent is probably rather 1,000 per microliter um, than the 1,500 we are used to for the non-Hispanic whites. Regarding body size, there's evidence that um, a large body mass index actually may be of disadvantage for immunotherapy as presented in this study. And then many other areas, for example, um, ability or uh, disability um, are just completely understudied with regard to their influence on cancer care. So I think we need more evidence. We need to close the evidence gaps to then close the care gap. And I would just like to visualize again um, what is meant in this context by equity, that equity is about giving everyone what they need to bring them up to the same level. <clears throat> and in order to do that, first of all, we need to know what they actually need. Thank you. Marie, thank you so much for that presentation. And welcome again for those who joined late. So moving on um, to our next uh, presenter, um, it is my distinct privilege to introduce Dr. Lola Fashion Ajay from the Food and Drug Administration. Um, Lola is a medical oncologist by training and the deputy director in the division of oncology in the Office of Oncologic Diseases at the Center for Evaluation and Research um, at the FDA. Uh, she provides scientific and policy guidance and oversight to multidisciplinary teams at FDA. Um, she is also the program lead of Project Equity at the FDA to ensure that data submitted to the FDA for approval of oncology 
uh, medicines um, adequately reflects the demographic representation of patients for whom the medical products are intended. Lola continues to inspire me personally and several others that I know with her work in equitable access in cancer care. Um, so without further ado, um, if we can roll, roll Lola's presentation. Thank you. I'll be providing a regulatory perspective on inclusive cancer research. And the perspective I'll be providing is one that is shared by the Oncology Center of Excellence at the US FDA. I have no disclosures. So I'll provide a background for what underpins our efforts around diversity and inclusion, and then describe some of our initiatives to promote diversity in cancer drug development. So to start with, uh, we believe that a diverse population and clinical trial really provides opportunity to generate data to inform the safe and effective use of medical products. Uh, a diverse uh, study population facilitates generalizability of study results and helps to characterize drug effects in the context of a diverse population, uh, taking into account variable disease presentation across the population, as well as variable response to medical products. Uh, clinical trials also provide the access to potentially promising medical products, uh, not only pre-market, but also after approval. And it's, imp it's important that um, all populations have equitable access to clinical trials as they are an important component of the management of certain diseases. In terms of how to define diversity, this is a broad inclusive term that can encompass clinical characteristics as well as demographic characteristics like race and ethnicity, age, sex, and other uh, factors. Uh, there may also be additional ways to characterize a population. Uh, the critical um, issue is uh, how it is being defined and for what purpose. FDA has had a longstanding posture on the importance of enrolling a diverse population into the clinical trials and studies uh, that serve as the basis for approval of medical products. And we've issued uh, previous guidances addressing how to collect and report data on race and ethnicity as an example, and then a general guidance on measures that can be taken to uh, enroll a diverse population, focusing on eligibility criteria, enrollment practices, and trial designs. And certainly our most recent guidances on COVID-19 uh, therapeutics and vaccines have also emphasized the need to enroll a diverse population. However, despite these measures over the years, uh, we continue to see disparities in terms of the representativeness of the study population um, it, it, for things like sex and race and age and ethnicity. And this is a summary of our drug trial snapshots, um, which is a publicly available database uh, that provides uh, demographic information for new molecular uh, and entities approved. Uh, by FDA. And this analysis uh, shown here uh, shows that there's equal distribution across the sexes, uh, overall across all therapeutics. However, uh, we do see uh, disparities uh, in some areas, as cardiology is an example, with uh, less women represented in clinical trials than is expected uh, on the basis of the uh, burden of the disease. Um, sex, uh, race, uh, uh, and ethnicity are other uh, factors that uh, we have seen under representation of certain groups and uh, is the basis for our increased uh, focus uh, on this. In oncology specifically, we did an analysis of uh, newly approved therapies uh, between 20, 2011 and 2017, uh, representing approximately 23,000 patients. And as you can see, the US population represents uh, approximately 20%, 20 to 25% of the overall study population enrolled in these trials. And looking at um, Black patients or African American patients as an example, you can see that in the overall population, they represent 2%. Uh, whereas in the US only participants, they represent 5% and less than 1% in trial participants uh, enrolled XUS. With the overwhelming majority of participants uh, be reporting white race. 
Uh, we also see that within the uh, groups, uh, uh, race groups, uh, there are there's a need for um, increased uh, granularity in terms of who exactly is represented in this group. So I'll go back one slide to show you that Asian participants appear to be uh, adequately represented in the overall study population here at 13%. Uh, but if you take a look at um, the Asian population in the United States by the census, you note that the overall majority are people who, who, uh, whose uh, countries of origin are China, the Philippines, Asia, and uh, India, and Vietnam. Um, however, when you look at the clinical trial population, you note that 40% of Asians are uh, enrolled in Japan, 25% in Korea, which really I think suggests that uh, the population of Asian patients enrolled in those uh, in, in our trials is not representative of the population uh, demographics in the United States. And we have also uh, issues with uh, representation by ethnicity. Importantly, about 40% of participants uh, have no data on ethnicity or it's not collected. Uh, and then for among those uh, for whom these data are collected, a mere 4% are reporting Hispanic uh, ethnicity, which is under uh, what is expected in the United States. There are also geographic uh, disparities in terms of representation with Europe really comprising the majority of participants being enrolled uh, in these trials. Uh, whereas uh, Africa, South America, and Central America, which isn't on this chart, um, are not uh, represented uh, adequately. So there's many societal, there are many factors contributing to some of these data, and I won't go through all of them for the sake of time, but I think we can identify areas that as regulatory agency, we have opportunity to, um, to uh, address uh, some of the barriers uh, within our purview. Um, so we have initiated a program in the Oncology Center of Excellence called Project Equity, whose aim is to ensure that the data that is submitted for approval of oncology medical products reflects the demographic representation of patients for whom these products are being uh, in, are intended. And this program really focuses on outreach and engagement, uh, policy development and implementation and research. And as part of our policy work uh, in this program, I wanted to talk with you a bit about uh, diversity plans to improve enrollment of participants from underrepresented racial and ethnic populations in clinical trials, our most recent guidance. And I'll focus on some of the aspects of this guidance. Um, so we really encourage sponsors to discuss their strategy to enroll a diverse population at any time throughout the medical product development and to start implementing measures as uh, early as their dose finding and activity estimating trials uh, and not just focused on the pivotal trials. We uh, recommend that they submit their diversity plans as soon as is practicable, but no later than when they're seeking advice from FDA uh, on the pivotal trials that would support an application, a marketing application. Um, these measures should really be implemented uh, early on in the clinical uh, development. And the plan really should comprise um, the following information. We want sponsors to provide an overview of the disease of condition about distributed by race. Um, and then uh, define enrollment goals in their diversity plan. And they can base these uh, enrollment goals on the epidemiology of the disease at a minimum, uh, but can also consider any available a priori information or data on outcomes that may inform the need to uh, either oversample or enrich the population for a certain group. We want them to specify uh, the measures that they will undertake to enroll and retain participants on the trials, focusing on the site locations among other considerations, and then discuss how uh, they will be monitoring uh, to ensure they're meeting their uh, specified goals and, uh, and addressing uh, any, um, uh, addressing their, their uh, redressing their, their strategy depending on whether they are falling below uh, expectations. And there are also several trial specific measures or tactics that can be undertaken to increase diversity. I've listed a few on the slide and this is not a, by any means a comprehensive um, list, um, but I think important uh, to uh, focus on flexibility uh, 
uh, in trial procedures and operations uh, that can really uh, uh, in a, help to uh, enroll a more diverse population uh, by leveraging technology for decentralization, uh, get, getting trials to where the population with the disease is receiving their care rather than expecting them to travel to uh, large academic centers of excellence uh, for clinical research, uh, performing some of the trial related procedures and visits uh, in a remote fashion or in a way that um, facilitates access uh, to, for patients uh, more locally. Um, and then uh, streamlining data collection uh, practices, uh, particularly when a safety profile has been established, uh, there's really no need to collect information as if it were the first uh, clinical trial um, uh, being uh, conducted. And then leveraging the use of real world data to characterize the population with the disease to inform those target goals and to evaluate the feasibility of conducting a trial in a specific uh, area, specific setting, um, and um, broadening uh, eligibility criteria as these have been identified as an important barrier uh, to clinical trial uh, diversity um, and basing the criteria on scientific and clinical rationale, um, and then uh, using multi-regional uh, uh, globe, uh, global drug development, I think, is something we can't ignore as the majority of trials that we review at the FDA are global trials. Um, only about 5% of trials are conducted exclusively in the United States. So we talk about diversity in the context of global drug development. So um, on that note, I will um, talk about uh, in the fact that, you know, there are acceptance criteria for uh, foreign data to support uh, uh, applications submitted to the FDA, uh, including the need for well-designed and conducted trials that are performed by clinical investigators who are qualified and have an, an in accordance with uh, good clinical practices, and um, the need to be able to validate these data through on-site inspections if necessary, and most importantly, that the data that's generated in these trials be applicable to the U.S. population and to U.S. medical practice. Uh, global development can really facilitate enrollment of diverse population, um, but we have to think about and plan uh, prospectively to ensure that we're considering geographic representation, disease prevalence, population demographics, uh, regulatory and research uh, milieu of the trials, and then uh, variable disease presentation and risk factors across um, the, uh, the uh, intended sites. Uh, there are really great benefits uh, to multi-regional clinical trials. They can enhance scientific and clinical understanding, um, and they can facilitate more efficient drug development by providing earlier access to drugs worldwide. So in summary, a prospective and intentional strategy must be implemented to ensure diverse representation in clinical research to increase access to clinical research, generate data that reflects a diverse population, and improve generalizability and applicability of study results. The strategy should be fully integrated in the research program and include specific goals across the full spectrum of clinical research, leverage available data and information, and carefully assess tactics that may impact participant diversity. Um, and multi-regional clinical trials are generally preferred mechanism for investigating new drugs for which regulatory submissions are planned in multiple regions. And strategic use of these trials um, it can really increase uh, efficiency in, in drug development and allow for exploration of the treatment effect uh, to diverse population and also support uh, potentially simultaneous submission of marketing applications uh, and regulatory decision making in multiple regions. I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Marie and Lola. Let's move on to the discussion. I think we can take this later away. May I remind you to put your questions into the Q&A, not into the chat function that would help us to um, clearly uh, see what is coming up. And um, I think we can just uh, switch the slides off so that you can see us better. Shushmita, do you want to take the first question? Absolutely. Um, so I'm actually going to not exactly take the questions that are in there, but I'm, I'm seeing a pattern um, that's coming up um, from some of our participants. And um, 
So, Marie, some of it is actually directed to you because um, you are in Germany and you are a researcher in Europe. Um, but I would also like to hear Lola's um, thoughts on this. Inequalities are different um, in the US and, and in the rest of the world. Um, so how do we account for that uh, when we're developing global clinical development plans um, in industry? And, and plus, um, what do we do when some of this data is not allowed for us to collect? Yeah, I think this is one of the most troubling questions, actually. Um, and that is also that that is um, um, one reason why I think uh, we have only just started and we still have a lot of brain work to do to um, to have clear definitions of what we're talking about and have terms which we can then actually um, compare amongst countries as well. So um, I, I agree, that, for example, um, there will be no data on race from Germany. And I think um, there are other European countries where this will just not happen. Um, and we need to find a way on that. Um, one thing, one thing I would like to know from Lola um, is about these multi-regional trials. I understand why this is um, why this is a way forward and why this is attempted, but um, particularly regarding the questions of, say, genetic background, might it not be also an approach? to not go for a huge multi-regional trials, but really go back to um, regional trials um, in itself, well-conducted trials in an area, um, which, is, uh, which is sort of um, deliberately not that diverse to have more information on that population. Sure. I mean, I'm happy to, to try to address that question. I mean, I think the, the big, uh, you know, my, my general response will be, as you said in your talk, you know, there's no one size fits all approach. And so I think that, you know, there are many times when we don't know a priori that there may be issues regarding genetics or, um, or even uh, aspects of drug metabolism that may differ across the population. And I think that the approach that I'm that we are proposing is, um, you know, once you determine that a multi-regional clinical trial is the appropriate mechanism to uh, obtain data uh, to support um, a new drug application, um, then, you know, we want those trials to be designed in such a fashion as to permit um, assessment of regional, potential regional differences that may exist across the population and, and um, that may contribute to the uh, overall effect. I agree with you that there may be um, particular um, factors, including uh, biological factors that may be, uh, uh, I, I won't say unique because I think that our global community is so uh, diverse and there's so, um, there's such dynamic movement across the population. Um, so I won't say unique to a region, but that uh, certainly may be enriched or uh, more commonly seen in a region. Uh, where it may make sense to do uh, more local trials. Um, but I can only speak as a US FDA uh, to say that, you know, we would accept foreign data um, uh, provided that those data are derived in a fashion that allows us to really understand, um, you know, any potential regional uh, effects uh, and also that uh, allows for uh, enrollment of a diverse population. These are priority areas for the agency. Thank you very much. Um, that, I have a question that was already touched by the first one, so uh, I won't hold it back longer, but it is a point of what are we actually collecting to measure diversity? So as a German, even the word race goes very difficult, you know, over my tongue. And um, if you look at the signs and, and the statements from uh, uh, several societies, race is an extremely poor denominator for genetic variants. Um, and uh, so obviously we have to work with what we do and, uh, it, uh, you know, 
racial inequalities are a clear reality and and obviously we are collecting them as well um in uh, in the way but what is actually first if you collect it across different countries and you've shown us lola how many foreign data comes into the us for for global approval so uh, what is the future of this is really um uh, collecting race or an ethnicity like Hispanic, which also seems very, very strange for a European, I must say so, to 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 single out our Spanish friends, but not our Italians. Or, you know, these seem to be so much driven by, let's say, social factors um, that, that I think, are we really doing the right thing to focus on them, um, to, to measure these things? And I do acknowledge that obviously, there are clear inequalities connected to them. I will try to take this. You know, I can't speak for what's going on in Germany, but uh, issues around race are very, very commonly uh, referenced on a daily basis in the United States. Um, so that is our experience. I mean, I think that the important point you bring up is, you know, what is race a proxy for um, and how good a proxy is it for whatever it is we assume it to be a proxy for? And are there better ways um, to get at uh, you know, genetic ancestry and genetic variability other than race and ethnicity? And I think, um, I think we, we acknowledge that um, these are not uh, purely biological factors. And, but, but, I, but what I think is really uh, a, um, an issue that often is not sort of looked at in, in, a, in, in the way uh, that I think uh, is, is unfortunate is that we spend so much time trying to determine what additional information or data or knowledge uh, we will be adding if we enroll a diverse population. And really the question ought to be, <laughs> why are we okay with conducting our clinical research in a, a population that does not include certain groups of the population. That's really the question that we should be asking ourselves as a scientific community. So, mm -hmm. you know, why are we not designing and executing trials that enroll a population that reflects the population with the disease? And, mm -hmm. you know, we don't know what we don't know. And so I think it's always unfortunate that we sort of dismiss the important contributions of, um, of, of, of what phenotype, differences in phenotype might bring to our understanding of the, um, of, uh, this, you know, the use of these medications. Um, so really, I, I, I try not to address this question that sort of requires that I justify why it's important to enroll a diverse population. And I think the question should be the reverse. Why are we comfortable with clinical trials that enroll 88% white participants with, you know, when other groups um, that in many cases overwhelmingly burn a disproportionate burden of the disease are not included in the trials. That is the question we should be asking. Mm -hmm. And I think we should put to rest this question about sort of what do we add to the research when we do this? Because these are not, these are imperfect uh, proxies. Um, I think that's, it's a distracting question, I think. And I don't think it moves us forward. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Lola. Um, so again, I will, be probably combining two questions, one that came from Barry uh, Levovich and also another one copied um, from uh, Armel Mionet. Um, so I think the gist of the question is, which I'll read, um, can we consider that diversity to enroll patients starts with selection of sites where diverse population is represented? and um, the PI represent the diversity itself. And I think Barry was also um, trying to say something very similar. So any thoughts on how do we go about identifying sites where we have the diverse population and how can we actually even increase the diversity of the um, PIs who conduct this research? 
are there some um, ways to do that more actively? May All I right. just uh, try to address that question? Because um, I think that touches about um, on, on something that might be uncomfortable for many PIs and many people who practice medicine and research, because we need to actually um, question ourselves. And when we founded that scientific working group, Diversity and Individual Medicine, we sort of deliberately called it scientific working group. And we thought this is not political at all. And we will just look at our patients. And we quickly noticed this does not work. And we cannot help being in a way Political. And when I started teaching diversity medicine, I also realized I need to have lots of aspects from sociology, which um, uh, which actually deal with the way we act and we act amongst each other. Um, we how we deal with our implicit biases, how we um, approach patients and so on, but also how we act as a community and who actually stands a chance to be a PI in our hospital as well. Um, so I think uh, this is an important aspect which needs to be um, recognized. And I um, always get the impression that, you, that the US is actually much ahead Whereas um, in Europe, we are sort of a little slower on that. And personally, I, I believe that these um, diversity action plans, which, for example, come from the FDA and which sort of force um, study sites via the sponsor, force the study sites to be more proactive on that, um, are very, very helpful and are actually essential for that as well. And just, just to go back again to the discussion just before, um, about why are we actually comfortable um, with 88% white people. It's not just, to my mind, it's not just white people, it's actually white people with no comorbidity comorbidities um, who are well off, um, uh, which I think is, is also, we, we need to also keep that in mind. So it's not diverse in terms of um, if he, if, in terms of gender and in terms of um, race. It is also, it has to be, but it, it also has to be diverse in terms of class as well um, to, in, to actually approach the patients um, appropriately. Thank you very much, Marie. Shall we build on a little bit on the topic of um, research sites? Because there are questions related to that. Um, uh, how do we select sites? How do we find um, that, you know, where is more representation? I, I think that is um, the tenor of, of several of the questions, including the use of real world data. Who would like to give a first answer on that. Um, maybe we hear you both as you come from different areas of perspective. I mean, I, you know, I'm not an expert on, on this topic. And I, and I think, you know, we were deliberately um, general in our recommendations in the guidance with regards to the specific measures that companies may undertake to enroll a diverse population in their clinical programs. But I think that there are a variety of of things that have been well documented in, in, in published uh, literature um, on the issue of improving access to clinical trials. And this is not just for race and ethnicity, but I, I think as a first step, one has to understand uh, sort of in whom the disease occurs and sort of what are those factors that um, uh, uh, are, uh, you know, adequately characterize the, the disease epidemiology uh, and access to care in general in a particular disease setting. And as a first step, I think the second thing is, you know, where are the patients who are receiving this care? Um, and where are these, these sites uh, that are designing these trials? And how can we uh, improve um, uh, sort of alignment with sort of where the patients are and where the sites are? Um, and I think that in the US, our experience is that even around many of these large um, uh, clinical research centers, there are huge population inequalities in terms of the surrounding population, but they just don't go to receive, to get their care at those institutions. So I think that there are many things to be addressed with respect to that. But I think even when they get there um, and even when they um, may be open to clinical trials, they often aren't asked or invited because of, uh, again, some of the biases that uh, Marie uh, mentioned, 
Um, and, but also I think some of it is, is not nefarious. I think that there's a sort of a paternalism in terms of, well, you know, this is an older woman and, and do I really want to put her on the trial? Or, you know, this is a woman who is a, you know, single uh, parent to multiple children and these trials will be too burdensome for her. So I think there's a little bit of that going on as well as, you know, this patient is not going to do well on my trial because they have diabetes or hypertension. So I think we have to be thinking about that, um, those kind of broad access um, issues and biases. Um, I, but I think there's also the way we design the trials. I think we've almost sort of designed the trials in a way that sort of uh, puts as a paramount and paramount importance the preservation of the homogeneity of this trial to detect any small effects of the drugs, no matter how small they may be, and really not applicable they may be to a larger population. Um, and so you sort of you know, uh, have these pages and pages of exclusion criteria, which really serve to create a very artificial population, um, you know, because the, your risk of, of, of being meeting one of those exclusion criteria sort of goes up, right, the, the longer the list is. Um, and so we've gotten into that. Um, and I think we have to go back to thinking that these trials should really be designed to answer important questions for the population that is going to be receiving the therapies rather than the population need to fit into these trials. So we've got to take a step back and say, you know, who has the disease? And if most of them have diabetes, we've got to study the drugs in the patients with diabetes. Uh, it makes no sense to study the population without the diabetes and then try to, and then expect the provider um, in the hospital uh, to now figure out how to treat this patient with diabetes or treat most of their patients who have diabetes uh, with the drug. So I think there are multiple levels. There, there are so many things I could think about, you know, sort of the, the clinical, uh, you know, research teams and sort of their awareness uh, about how to uh, work with patients who have different backgrounds or, uh, you know, who may be experiencing um, uh, some barriers or challenges that may not be the ones that, you know, sort of rich and well-to-do and healthier patients who travel all around the country to be on clinical trials may be experiencing. So I think that there's just multiple factors and the system has been set up in a certain way for so many decades that I think it's going to take a lot of kind of um, deliberate, deliberate action on all of our parts to, to really identify ways that the system is set up to really not encourage diversity, um, whether it's from the training of the investigators, who becomes a physician, uh, who is in the medical schools, um, all the way to uh, some of these other issues that I've been talking about. Yeah, I think, uh, Lola, this was a great summary, um, at least from Europe. I'd, I'd, I'd like to also add, I think we have a problem with legislation as well. So um, it is so bureaucratic nowadays and so expensive to do a clinical trial that, in fact, clinical trials are only done um, to, to find out a little benefit from this drug, which is the drug on focus. And clinical trials are rarely done to solve a clinical question, which has been, when I started medical school, clinical trial, the purpose of a clinical trial was to solve a clinical question. And, and um, I find this, is, this has somehow got lost with increasing bureaucracy and the inability of the doctors um, and the physicians to design the trial for the patients in need. Thank you so much for um, really, really insightful comments. And um, Lola, you kind of just summed it up, right? That it is just not the clinical trials access starts from communities um, and how we enroll people in medical schools. And it's just... It has taken decades to get here and it probably will take us some time, but this is a great start of the conversation, I would think, right? Um, you know, one of the things that was asked in, in, in the chat as well, um, I personally don't think that you can directly respond to that about what are some of the messages that are being given to the patients in terms of like making them um, uh, more, uh, 
you know, likely to access a clinical trial or, or rec be recruited in a clinical trial, you know, I would just kind of twist that question a little bit and ask, what's working? What, what, what did you see working so far? And what can we do more of? I think one one um, sort of under-recognized factor in the individual patient is the trust in the treating physician and um, the authorities and the institution. So I think we just need to be good at our job. And then most patients will happily um, enroll in a clinical trial if we think it is a good idea. But um, that takes care at, or that takes time and we need to be um, we need to take care to actually really be good doctors and, and trustworthy. But Marie, don't we need, uh, you know, more, um, let's say, cultural awareness for that? I think it's very different to explain a clinical trial, let's say, to a fellow academic uh, guy or to a, you know, to a large Turkish family where where the mother who's going to be treated doesn't speak the language. And, uh, you know, these things, I think, need to change within the sites that may come about with, with the changes we're discussing. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I just um, missed that out. But absolutely. And I think we need to have um, a, a sort of a, a novel description of what good medicine is. And uh, to my mind, good medicine mm -hmm. has to be culture sensitive and has to be reflexive and um, and sort of think about what am I actually doing and, and, and so on. So um, absolutely. Lola. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I think, um, uh, I mean, I think that I would agree with everything Marie just uh, said and, and what Axel added to that. I, I mean, I think, you know, educate, the education part is always important, but, but it's multidirectional, right? It's not just the education of the patient, uh, but also the education of the provider um, and the uh, entire research team as to, you know, what are the things that are important for these particular groups of patients but also for the individual patient, um, you know. So I think um, that that is something that we can always improve upon um, in our delivery of care, but also in the way that we do research um, is really understanding what's a priority for the patient sitting in front of me, but also for the group, right? Um, and there's not, there's not always alignment. Um, but but I think an, another important thing that we um, we uh, that is really important and that keeps bring, coming up is this issue of trust and i think again i think that that's always thought of as the patient doesn't trust me um but i think sometimes we fail to ask ourselves <laughs> do i really trust my patient when i make all these assumptions about who they are and and what they may be interested in or what they can do or why they're doing what they're doing why they're making the decisions that they're making do we trust them so you can't expect trust in one way um, and so I think um, a lot of that, do I trust my patient enough to ask them if they want to be in a trial? Or am I just going to move forward with the assumptions that I have about his or her interests in participating? Um, so I think um, that's uh, an important um, shift, I think, in thinking that needs to, to occur. Axel, I think we're on time. And yeah, we have uh, four over. minutes left. But uh, um, so uh, if if either of you, uh, Lola or Marie, would like to make a final statement, and otherwise we will close um, the um, webinar here. I can just quickly say thank you so much for putting this together. Um, we're very interested to hearing the European perspective on many of these issues. So I really thank Marie for um, her participation. I will say that, you know, this, this area and this topic is one where we are so far behind. And I think that we can't hold ourselves to the expectation that we will know all the answers around how this is all gonna turn out before we get started. And we are so far behind, we've gotta get started. And I think we have to be comfortable knowing that we will, um, we will encounter some pain points and we can just need to figure out how to work through those issues. We can't wait for perfection, a perfect plan. Um, and I think some of the tools that we discussed today, the diversity plans are just that. They're tools to help us to start to think about this in a way that is strategic, um, well thought out, prospective and early 
um, so that we're not um, continuing to replicate the same types of data uh, over time. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this. Thank you, Lola. And I think I just have to add my thanks as well for exactly the same to give give me the opportunity to take part to cooperate and discuss and thank you to Lola for in a way taking the lead in taking action um, even if we all together are still imperfect it's exactly as you say we need to start somewhere and and get going and and thanks for that yeah, I would like to thank you all very much as well. And I would like to highlight that I think the FTA initiative, especially with the diversity plans, is going to have a lot of effects that will trickle down because now industry has to speak to sites and ask sites. So how diverse are you? How open are you to, to, to patients from, from different backgrounds? Where are they? They may five kilometers away, but they are not coming to your um, clinical study site. So why is that the case? How can we change it? Should we select another site in, in that? So I think you've started a process. It's like an avalanche. And I suppose it's getting larger and stronger. The more I've thought about this topic, the more it has become clear to me, this is not just something that we have to do. It is it, also very much related to what we are or what we want to be. If we want to instill trust into a clinical trials process and into the care we give, we also have to answer the question, How and, and you related to that, Lola, how comfortable am I with people who are very different from me in many aspects, how they look, how they think about physicians, how they think about other interactions are relevant here. And I have to ask myself that question. I think this kind of, process is necessary for all of us to to become much more representative and lola you <clears throat> said that and marie you too we cannot continue to do uh, drug development only you know based on a small slice of the population and not be representative that's not possible so thank you all for helping us to move this a little bit further if i can have the next slide please michael um, I just have to tell you that there is more coming from the CDDF. We have a multiple stakeholder um, workshop that is two days in Amsterdam in November on histology independent drug development. This is something with many different names, but this is now the European regulatory term for it. Is this the future for cancer drugs? You are very welcome to register through our website. We have another webinar, the second on the aspects of immunotherapy and radiotherapy combinations, which is an exciting but also complicated topic. And we have our three-day annual conference, which addresses a lot of different topics um, across the drug development in oncology. So please check out our website. Next slide. We thank you, of course, all very much for your participation. It's very important that you are here. If you scan the survey form here with uh, this QR link, uh, you can give us feedback or by any other way. We are very happy to have you here and we welcome to hear from you about um, this and other things we do. Thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>